Today we're going to be talking about food as international aid. And our GW speaker today, who's going to kick us off, is Tony Castleman, who was here last week with us. Professor Castleman is a development econ economist uh, whose research focuses on nutrition and food security and the roles that respect dehumanization and human recognition play in public health, poverty, and conflict. Um, he has a long um, career and experience outside of GW prior to coming to join us on the faculty. He worked for USAID funded food and nutrition technical assistance projects at the Academy for Educational Development. I have to have my notes to remember all of these terms. Um, where he worked to provide technical assistance to USAID, governments, and implementing organizations to strengthen food and uh, nutrition and food security policies and programs around the world. He's worked with, um, he's worked as a director of an NGO in India where he designed and managed a range of health, nutrition, education, and poverty alleviation projects. And he's also worked for the World Bank for a year on applications of participatory methodologies um, to poverty programs. So let's welcome Dr. Kasselman. Thank you, Kim. Um, and I want to thank um, Dr. Robian and uh, Mrs. Knapp and the whole team for inviting me to uh, be with you today. It sounds like a, a very exciting class. I was happy to be here last week to um, see some of what uh, um, the, some of the work that Dr. Robian was presenting on uh, domestic hunger and domestic food insecurity. So today, as you as you see, I'm going to be focusing more on international hunger and and international um, food food insecurity. Um, just to go through a little bit how I'm going to be presenting today, I'm going to first start out with a general discussion of why we use food aid, what food aid is and why we, we use it. Um, and then in order to understand food aid and food aid programming, it's important to understand what the problems are that we're trying to address. And in this case, it's generally hunger, um, food insecurity, and uh, malnutrition. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time just talking about what food security is, what malnutrition is, um, what the dimensions of it are, what the, the scale and the scope of the, of the uh, problem um, it are. And then um, talk a little bit more specifically about different types of programs that we use to, to address them with a particular emphasis on food aid, because I know that was uh, the topic that um, uh, I think there's interest in, in hearing about, about today. And then I'll end just by um, summing up a little bit what some of the strengths and some of the limitations are um, in, in food aid. And I think that will um, lead nicely into the presentation that um, Ms. Um, Esposito will be giving you on some of the sort of exciting developments that have happened within the US government um, around, around food aid. Um, so first of all, why food aid? Why do we, the United States government, the World Food Program, the United Nations, the different groups that provide food aid, um, why is food aid part of the sort of portfolio of um, foreign assistance that, uh, that we provide? Um, well, first and foremost, um, there are you know, huge food insecurity and malnutrition problems in a, lot of, in a lot of countries. And food aid is one tool that is available to address them. Um, it's certainly not the only tool. Um, in many contexts, it may not be the most effective tool. But in some contexts, it can be very effective. And in fact, it has some advantages over other types of interventions. Um, in particular contexts. And an example might be, um, do people remember the earthquake in Haiti that happened a few years ago? Yeah. So after a, a sort of major catastrophe, like an earthquake, um, oftentimes um, one could think, well, why not just you know, provide uh, money to people? If people have enough money, then they'd be able to get whatever clothing, whatever housing, whatever food, food they, they uh, need. Um, can anyone think of a reason why just providing money in a situation like the Haiti earthquake uh, might not work? Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, that's exactly right. There may not be a market. There may not be a place where they can go to get food. And in a situation like that, food aid can be much more effective than just providing providing money. Um, another example would be in some situations, even when there are markets, if you provide cash to a household, 
Um, it may not be that they spend that money on food, even if there's a tremendous need for food. Um, the classic example, and I'm a, a husband and a father, so I can give this example. The, the classic example is where money, additional money is made available to a household, and the father and the husband decides to use that money for something else. It might be for something that's not beneficial at all, like, you know, like alcohol, but even it might be for something like sort of adding on a, build, a room in the house, which might be useful, but might not be addressing basic needs that, they're, that one's children have for food and for better, better nutrition. So in contexts like that as well, sometimes food aid can be more effective than providing money or other, other forms of, of assistance. Um, there are also, as I've put up here, challenges and limitations, and we'll talk about these um, a, a bit um, as well. Um, one example of this is the way food aid, most of the food aid in the US, that the US government provides, is we purchase food from farmers here in the US. We package up the food, we ship it in a boat um, across the ocean, say, to a port in Africa, and then ship it within Africa from the port um, over land to a place where there's a need and a, and a program. Well, as you can imagine, that's a fairly expensive process. And if the money that were used for all of that were used instead just to purchase food at the, you know, in the country where the program is going on, we could purchase a lot more food and perhaps therefore have um, a, greater, a greater impact. And one of the things I think um, Ms. Esposito will be talking about um, after me is some of the, the reforms and some of the developments that are happening in, in food aid to try to move more towards local purchases instead of um, purchasing food and um, shipping it. However, on that last point, and I want to, this last bullet saying political support exists for food aid, um, the fact that we buy, in the US government, we buy the food here also means that there's a lot of support for food aid in the US Congress. Because if you're a senator or a congressman from a state that has farmers that are selling their, their food, um, that's something that might be a very popular program for you. And you might even support food aid and support money for food aid um, even more than if it were just cash. And that's an important reason why food aid programs have persisted at quite a high level. And I think Ms. Esposito will be talking more about this, but it's um, annually about $2 billion of food aid in the, um, uh, in the, the US government program. Um, all right, but I'm going to focus primarily right now on that, um, on that top one, the need to address food insecurity and malnutrition. And I think we need to understand what the nature is of food insecurity and in, of malnutrition in particularly in developing countries to understand how food aid programs and other food security programs work. So this top picture is a, um, a picture of a family in, in Pakistan. And the woman is a, um, she worked in a textile mill and she lost her job. And she was describing to the reporter who took this picture how challenging it is for her to feed her, her five children. And this is a picture of her preparing food for her, her children. And this is an example of what we call household food insecurity. There's not enough food in the household for, the, for her family. And she's continually worried and trying to scrounge to try to um, fill her children's stomachs and not always able to, to provide um, sufficiently nu nutritious food. Um, the bottom uh, picture is a picture of a, of a little girl in um, Chad um, in 2012 who is severely malnourished. There was a, a large increase in severe malnutrition among young children in Chad and some of the surrounding countries in 2011 and 2012. Partly there was a drought and then there were some other factors. Um, and both f food insecurity like this and severe malnutrition as the, the picture below um, illustrates are huge problems. And I'm going to be talking about the, the, the numbers momentarily, but over 3 million children each year die from, from malnutrition. But at the same time, I mean, all of you, had, many of you had heard of the Haiti earthquake. Um, how many of you have heard about or read about household food insecurity in, in Pakistan recently? A few, all right. And what about severe malnutrition in, in Chad? A few. Very, very few. And I think that's one of the um, things that's 
in terms of food insecurity and undernutrition, when, a, when there's a large catastrophe like an earthquake or the tsunami, I think there's a lot of attention given to the resulting food insecurity, the, the undernutrition. But situations like this are present in many, many countries um, at a fairly wide, wide scale. And that's one of the reasons why um, food security programs and food aid programs are needed not just in terms of emergency relief to address sort of a catastrophes or emergencies, but to help strengthen um, development and to help strengthen households' ability to address uh, their, their food needs. Um, so just to go a little bit more specifically in uh, what food security means, and I think Dr. Robian um, covered a bit of this last week. Um, in 1996, the, led by the UN, there was a, a World Food Summit to um, sort of decide what what the common definition of food security was that was going to be used. And this is the definition that, um, that emerged from that. And this is the definition that most UN agencies, a lot of countries, um, use. USAID has a, a similar um, definition. It's um, slightly, slightly different. And essentially, it's when, when all people at all times have physical, social, and economic access to food that's sufficient. It means the quantity is enough. It's safe. It means it's hygienic, so it's not going to you know, give you diarrhea if you, if you eat it. And it's, it's nutritious. It provides adequate, adequate nutrients. So if there's only access to foods that are carbohydrates, to grains, that would not be food, uh, a food secure situation, because there would be people that don't, are not getting enough nu nutritious foods. They're only getting carbohydrates. They're maybe not getting vitamins and minerals and, uh, and uh, protein. Um, so this, I think, we can use as the sort of a working definition of food security. Um, this I put up here, the Feed the Future is a US government initiative to try to strengthen food security globally. And in the description of what the objectives are of Feed the Future, um, this, is, this is a quotation drawn from that, that a family is considered food secure when its members do not live in hunger or fear of hunger. And I put that up there because it, it points out this fear of hunger where, where food security is not just whether today I have enough food. It's also whether if I'm worried about, you know, if my husband gets sick tomorrow, I'm not going to have enough food to feed uh, my children for the next week. Or if I have to, um, if I have to go, uh, if I have to migrate to find work, I'm not going to have enough food to, um, tomorrow. If there's not enough rain next month, I'm not going to have enough food to feed my family. And the fear of hunger, that, this issue of stability, which I'll talk about in a, in a bit, is a very critical component of what food security, food, food security is. Um, so we can divide food security into um, dimensions. And these are the common dimensions that are used. And I'll, um, I'll define them in a moment. But basically, availability is that food has to be available. Um, access is, even if it's available, a household may or may not have access to it. It may be that there's, you don't have enough money to purchase food. It may be that the food, there's no road to the market where the food, where the, the food is. So one needs to have access to it. Utilization talks about, um, is, refers to that your body can adequately use the food. If you're eating food but you have diarrhea, so the food is just running through you, your body is not able to utilize the food. If you're eating food but there's not enough nutrient content in the food, it's only carbohydrates, like the example I gave before, that's not going to help a young child to grow adequately because there's not enough not enough nu nutrition. If you're eating food, but every few weeks you're getting sick because you haven't had your immunizations if you're a young child, again, that may prevent you from adequately using your, your food, utilizing the food in your body. So that's the sort of physiological process of utilizing food. And then stability is what I was referring to a moment ago. Stability is that this food security continues and is consistently there. If you're food secure today, but you may not be next month, then you're not considered food, food secure because the uh, stability is not there. So just briefly, availability, this is, as I mentioned, is sort of the, um, the, the adequate quantities of food are available. Notice in the definition, this is from the UN Food and Agriculture Organization. It even includes food aid as part of what um, determines whether there's food availability or not. This is normally measured at the national level, that a country has sufficient food. Um, food access, as I mentioned, is that, and this is generally measured at the household level, um, is that you have an, enough resources to access food. Um, this could be food that you're growing yourself in your farm, in your garden, or more often also that you have adequate income or other um, resources to uh, purchase food. And then food utilization, as I mentioned, is um, 
utilization of food is the utilization of it. And it, it, notice it mentions um, through adequate diet, which is the food that you're eating, but also clean water because of issues like diarrhea that I mentioned, um, sanitation, and health care to reach a state of, of nutritional well, well-being. So this is a physiological process. So it's generally measured at the individual level. We talk about you know, if a child is well-nourished, if a woman is anemic or, anemic or, or uh, not. Um, and then food stability is what I referred to before, um, that you're not at risk of losing that food security um, as a result of sudden shocks or cyclical events. A shock, the, you know, the Haiti earthquake would be an example of a sudden shock. Um, where do you, you know, all of a sudden because of the earthquake, do you lose your food, uh, you, know, you no longer have enough food? And cyclical events would be things like if um, in the lean season before a harvest, um, where there, you know, every year we know that, you know, a family knows that there's going to be less, um, you know, less harvest then because the harvest ha hasn't come yet and less food in their stocks. And if cyclically every year they're not, they're at risk of losing, um, you know, adequate uh, food, then that would be an example again of uh, poor food, food uh, stability. So this is a, a little bit of a more complicated diagram, and I realize it may be hard to see, but it was one of the reading assignments, so I think you all, you all have this. This essentially is a, a more in-depth framework that talks about not just this is food availability, food access, and food utilization, but also what all of the different determinants are, what all of the different things are that determine whether uh, those uh, dimensions of food security exist or not. And a couple of things, I know you have this, but a couple of things I just want to point out. One is notice the flow, that food availability feeds into food access, that essentially food availability is necessary to have food access. It's not sufficient. There's a lot of these other things as well that determine whether food access is there. But if at the national level there's not enough food available, then all of the households are not going to have adequate food access. There's, a, there's other things as well that, that determine that. And I know Robert Egger last week was talking about wages. This is where wages comes in. That wages determines cash income, which determines market purchases, which determines whether, uh, you know, whether one's ha one ha a household has adequate access to food. Um, and the other thing I want to just mention is you can see how many different uh, determinants there are of, of um, food, food security. This is where, again, the food utilization, the dietary intake, what one eats, is one determinant. But health status um, is another. Water and sanitation is another. You know, practices, child care practices is another. So I think we often think of nutrition as being about food, but actually a lot of these other things also you know, come in um, and, and influence. It. So I just want to go through a couple of the ways that we, we measure some of these things, um, and also to talk a little bit about the, the scale. So food availability, um, the measure that's uh, most commonly used is from the FAO, and it looks at undernourishment. And it's a little bit of a complicated measure, but it essentially looks at all of the food that a country has, and then looks at all of the energy needs that the people in that country have. And it determines to what extent the food that's available meets the energy needs or not. And using this measure, um, right now there are about 842 million people who are undernourished, who are not, don't have available to them adequate energy. Now, this isn't even talking about vitamins and minerals and protein and other things. It's just talking about energy. And if you look at this as a map of under, undernourishment, and the dark maroon, um, these few places, and Haiti's over there too, are places where more than 35% of the population are under, undernourished. Um, the red is where uh, 25 to uh, 35 percent, and then the orange, uh, the um, and the uh, uh, yellow is, I think, less than 15 percent, and the green are places where less than um, 5 percent. So you can see, sub-Saharan Africa is certainly where um, this problem is um, its uh, most uh, severe. Um, and um, you know, not surprisingly, most of the of food aid actually right now um, is going towards uh, sub-Saharan Africa. There is some, um, whoops, in um, Haiti. And there's some in South Asia, but uh, primarily um, sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so measures of food access, this, as I mentioned, is looking at the household. Um, look at um, dietary diversity. Do households have enough different uh, types of foods that they're, that they're accessing? Um, there are these scales that look at ish, um, sort of events, like have you had to go to bed without food? Have you been in a situation where there's no food at all in the household? 
Um, and then this is one that also measures stability, months of adequate household provisions. Um, I mentioned about like the, the lean season. If a household every year for two months doesn't have adequate household pr provisions, um, that's a sign of not having adequate access to food, and it's a sign of having not, um, you know, not stable access to, to, to food as well. So those are some of the, the measures. Then utilization, which is you know, looking at nutrition. There are a number of different, of different measures for uh, utilization. I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna go through these because when we talk about programs next, um, there are different programs that are trying to address different types of uh, mal malnutrition. So stunting means that children, and in particular young children less than the age of five, um, are not as tall as they should be. And it means that they're not growing adequately, and that's usually the result of over a long period of time um, not getting adequate, adequate nutrition. It could also be from you know, diarrhea, from, from disease, but it's usually not like starvation, like the, the photos that Dr. Robian showed last week, where it's a very severe, acute shortage of food. It's more, oftentimes people can be getting enough energy, but if they're not getting enough nutrients to help them to, to grow, they're shorter than they should be, and it's called uh, stunting. And one of the things with stunting is it's not just that you know, it's important for children to be to be taller, but stunting is also correlated with cognitive development, with lots of different sort of development stages um, for, for young children. Um, because if they're not you know, growing adequately, it means they're not getting enough nutrients, and those nutrients affect other important um, outcomes as well. The second one is wasting, and that's for how tall you are, are you heavy enough? And this is an acute measure of usually relatively short term, but very severe lack of food. Um, where you're, for some reason you're not able to eat enough. It could be because of a famine. It could be because of recurrent infections, so your body's not absorbing, absorbing the food. And this is like Kwashiorkor and Merasmus, the um, examples that Dr. Robian gave um, last week. And where you've seen pictures like during famines of, of children, um, that's often um, a wasting. Um, underweight, which is where for your age you don't weigh enough, that can be either or a combination of both can lead to that. And then body mass index, some of us know that. That's similar to wasting, but it's for, um, it's for older children or adults. It's looking at your weight divided by your, um, the square of your, of your height. And then anemia is an example of a measure that looks at micronutrient status. Um, there are many different, there are a few different causes of anemia. It can also be worms. It can, um, it can also be, be malaria. But a common source of anemia is not getting enough iron. And in particular, in pregnant women, this is a common problem and can have um, serious ramifications both for the woman and for her, um, her, her baby. Um, so when we think about the scale of undernutrition, um, undernutrition causes, as I mentioned before, over three million deaths a year of children um, under the age of five. And this is almost half of the total child mortality in the, in the world. So under, undernutrition is, a, is really a, a huge cause of um, deaths um, among, among young children. If we look at a, the map, um, this is now the pink areas are the countries where um, greater than 30% of the children are undernourished. This is using uh, under uh, nutrition. This is using stunting. Um, so their, their heights are not um, as, as, they're not as tall as they need to be. And again, it's a sign of um, a lot of um, various forms of inadequate n nutrition and um, underdevelopment. And what's interesting here is you see some of the countries are the same. I think uh, Ethiopia and uh, Zambia are the two countries that both have the highest rate, uh, among the highest in undernourishment, energy availability, and um, stunting. But one thing that's interesting here is if you look at South Asia, you look at India, um, Nepal, Bangladesh, they have among the highest rates of stunting, but their rates of um, inadequate availability of energy, of, under, of undernourishment, um, it's not good. It's between 15 to 25 percent, but it's nowhere near among, among the highest. Um, does anyone have any ideas why you might have a country where a f most of the country does have adequate energy, they're getting enough calories, yet there's still a lot of stunting among, among young, young children? This is a little bit of a, of a tough question, but someone might have an idea. Yeah, please. They don't have the right food. Yes, they have the food, but they don't have all the vegetables or fruits. Yes, yes, That's, that is absolutely um, a, a very um, large part of the reason as to why 
um, children. What, what she said is they're getting it maybe they might be getting enough calories, but they're not getting enough different kinds of foods that, that they need. They're not getting fruits, vegetables, meats, beans, um, other other things. That's probably the the single um, most important reason why in South Asia people are getting enough energy, or a lot of people are getting enough energy, but they're not. Um, children are still stunted. Other reasons are hygiene. Um, there's uh, there's poor hygiene in a lot of settings in these countries, and so issues like like uh, diarrhea can can come into um, effect and healthcare to to a certain extent where um, where children are, are um, still ill. Okay, so let, let's get to programs. Let me see how I'm doing for for time. Okay, um, so when we think about programs, I'm going to start with the, with the utilization ones, programs that are trying to address under undernutrition. Um, we can think about these in a few different categories. There are certainly, and I'm going to go into more depth talking about programs that address specific types of malnutrition. But as we saw when we looked at the determinants of, of undernutrition, water, sanitation, and hygiene are also you know, determinants of undernutrition. And maternal and child health are as well. Now, when we think about these two programs that are trying to improve hygiene or programs that are trying to improve maternal and child health, food aid is definitely not the most important component of those, those types of programs. When we think about hygiene, water, and sanitation, what sorts of inputs do you think would be valuable if you're trying to improve water, sanitation, and, and, and hygiene? Does, does anyone have any ideas? Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, yes, improved, improved sanitation systems um, and improves, improved access to clean water for, for drinking. However, there are some interesting programs that actually use food aid to help contribute to this as well. Um, one example um, is in communities if you're trying to build a new water system, um, you need labor to, to, to do that. And there are programs that it's called Food for Work, where food, instead of paying money, you provide food as um, compensation for people to build new water systems or new um, sanitation, et cetera. And one advantage of that is it's providing food for people. But another is that it's called self-targeting. The types of um, people who might be willing to do that sort of work for food are likely to be the people who need food the most. Um, if you're paying cash, um, you may also be able to target some of the people who are poorest and, um, you know, and need food. But you might get a lot of other people as well who you know, want additional money but don't necessarily need, need uh, food. So food for work programs can actually contribute to, um, to uh, programs trying to address water, sanitation, and hygiene. Um, maternal and child health programs as well. I, um, Dr. Robian mentioned that I, used, I was director of an, uh, an NGO in India. When I was there, one of the programs we were doing was actually a food aid program. We were getting food from USAID, from the US government, and we were running some education and some health programs. And as part of the health program, we would provide, on a monthly basis, we'd provide food to pregnant women and to children who were under the age of three. And it was a combination of wheat and some sort of corn soy blend flour um, that could be used to make different things, and vegetable oil. Vegetable oil is, is quite valuable in that setting, and so that was um, a big quite appealing um, to the, to the uh, beneficiaries, to the participants of the program. And they would receive the food. And then as part of the program, they would also participate in education sessions to improve feeding practices, to improve knowledge about what sorts of foods um, to feed young children, about uh, breastfeeding, about water and sanitation. Um, and at the time that we were providing food, we would also be weighing the children. And if children were, you know, were very undernourished, providing additional attention to, to them. Them. And nurses and midwives were there to provide immunizations to the children to prevent the disease at the time of, of getting the food. So the, one of the people who was a, the program manager of the program used to say to us, to the team that was working on it, he said, this food says it's nice when the women and the children themselves eat it, but that's not our main intention. He said the food is, the word he used is goose. goose um, in Urdu or in Hindi, it means bribe. And he was sort of half joking, but he said the food is a goose to bring all of the women and all the children and all of the families uh, here so that they, you know, to help encourage them to get immunizations, to participate in education sessions, to have their, their uh, children weighed. So that's an example, another example of how food sometimes can be used for objectives like uh, maternal and child health by providing the food, and especially the vegetable oil, which was very, um, as I said, um, 
uh, valuable to um, some of the, of the households. It helped to encourage them to participate in the, in, in the program. All right, so I'm just going to talk um, a bit about programs that address um, these different uh, nu nutrition issues. Um, how many of you have ever um, eaten Nutella? Wow, a lot of people. That's great. So um, Nutella, believe it or not, was um, in some respects an inspiration for one of the um, most important and I think impactful breakthroughs in addressing um, severe malnutrition um, among children. Um, up until fairly recently, when children were severely malnourished, and this is the wasting that we were talking about, um, they have, when children are wasted, they have a much higher risk of dying. It's somewhere between five to 20 times but I think the number that's often used is eight, they're eight times more likely to die than a, a child who's not severely malnourished. And up until recently, the best way we had to treat children who were severely malnourished was with therapeutic milks that were specially developed with um, sugar added and micronutrients added and oil added. And because they were milks, they needed to be provided in hygienic settings, because there was a lot of water. And also, they needed to be kept, once the milk was prepared, it needed to be, kept, to be kept cold. So mothers with children who were severely malnourished would need to come to a therapeutic feeding center. It was a facility. It was often far away from, from where they lived, and stay there while their, children was, while their children were treated, until their children were better, and then they'd be discharged and go home. And there were a lot of challenges with this system. Um, one challenge was because it, the, the mothers would have to leave the rest of their family, leave work, leave you know, whatever their household um, duties, they often would not come or wait to go come until the children were very, very malnourished. Um, another problem was while they were away, that sometimes had a bad impact on the rest, the rest of the family. And then a third problem was once they were discharged and came home, if the children relapsed, it was a problem. And maybe they'd go back. Um, maybe they wouldn't. Maybe they wouldn't go, go back in time. So a number of years ago, there were a, no, a group of public health specialists who were thinking about how can we improve this system? And in particular, how can we improve the types of foods that we use to address severe malnutrition? And one of the people who was working on this was a, um, a French pediatrician. His name's um, Andre, Andre uh, Briand. And while he was thinking about this, he was sort of experimenting with different things that he could add to the therapeutic milk. He was having breakfast with his children, and the children loved uh, Nutella. And he saw the bottle of Nutella, and a light bulb went on over his head. Um, and he thought, what about a paste? And the thing with a paste like Nutella is it has very low moisture. It's very dense, right, N Nutella? So there's very little water content in it. And because there's very little water content, the opportunities for bacteria to grow, to have hygiene issues, is much, much lower. And it doesn't need to be refrigerated. So he worked with um, a food company in France, and there have been others also working on this since then, to develop this product. And some of you may have heard of uh, Plumpy Nut. Um, the, the sort of general term for this type of food are ready-to-use therapeutic foods. And it's essentially peanut butter with sugar added, uh, vegetable oil added, milk powder added, and micronutrient powder added. Yes, and I think um, Ms. Esposito is going to be sharing some of the similar products that um, are now part of uh, USAID um, food, food aid. Um, and this has really revolutionized how children with severe malnutrition are treated, because now Children, they can be screened, and there are community workers that go out and screen and identify children who might be severely malnourished. And if they have medical complications, they may still need to come to a medical facility. But the wide majority can be screened and maybe given some medicine to prevent um, worsening and sent home with these packets of the um, of ready-to-use therapeutic food. And it's drastically improved how um, severe, severe malnutrition um, has been treated. So next time you eat Nutella, you can um, think, of, think about that. And I think, as I said, uh, Ms. Esposito will be talking a little bit more about some of the, some of the, the different specific products. Um, so when we think about stunting, though, and chronic under, undernutrition, it's um, a bit of a different um, a bit of a different situation because, um, for one thing, as I mentioned, stunting is highly correlated with a lot of other development, um, uh, sort of child, child development outcomes. And the causes are much more ingrained. The severe acute malnutrition is usually some sort of short term and severe shortage of food or, or, or infection. And a product like this, um, if uh, you know, in most cases, can actually help to cure the child from the severe, severe malnutrition. Um, 
stunting and undernutrition is much, much harder to reverse once, once it happens. And the causes are much, much more deep-rooted. deep, deep rooted. Um, It has to do with the, with the dietary practices you mentioned, you know, what kinds of access to food that households have, um, hygiene and health. Um, and because it's so hard to reverse, What's really needed is prevention and um, preventing it from happening to begin with. And there's been a lot of research recently that's um, shown really clearly that the golden window or the critical period for preventing stunting is this what's called the thousand days. And if you count up you know, days in a woman's pregnancy and then a child's life until he or she is two years old, it's about 1,000 days. And that is, the, that is the time period when preventing stunting um, is going to be most effective. And that's also the time period when, if you don't prevent stunting and a child you know, reaches you know, 18 months or two years and is stunted, it's very, very hard to, uh, to reverse that. So therefore, the types of programs that, um, that try to uh, um, address, I guess and can go back to here, are basically trying to address these various determinants of, um, of stunting. The practices, sort of the behaviors the, and the feeding practices that um, uh, parents have for their children, um, that they have adequate access to food, um, hygiene, and also health. And one type of program that, uh, since we're talking about food aid, that utilizes food aid is one that, they, that USAID has been leading called the Prevention of Malnutrition in Children Under Two. And in this community, we'd like to have um, catchy acronyms, or acronyms, I don't know if they're catchy. And so PM2A is the acronym for this um, with this approach. And essentially, it's somewhat similar to the program I was just talking about in India, the one where the guy said the food is, is um, like, a, like a bribe. Only in this case, I think the food is also intended and I think um, is able to also have some direct nu nutritional benefits. Um, w this program, what happens is food rations are provided to pregnant women and to, and to young children. And they're also educated about how they can use the food and, and recipes. Um, with that, and this is an example of a, a group meeting where a health worker is providing information to mothers about, um, fe about feeding practices. And so there's some form of behavior change. That, that comes about. And then it's their links, um, participants in the program are linked to health and nutrition services, to immunization, to maybe antenatal checks for um, pregnant, pregnant women. And this program has shown um, a lot of promise and a lot of benefits in preventing um, stunting. And there have been some studies that have shown that this approach of trying to prevent stunting by providing these services to all the pregnant women and all of the children <laughs> under two in a particular area, that that's more effective than trying to target only the children who are already malnourished. And the reason, as I said, one reason, as I said, is because for stunting, prevention really is much more effective than, uh, than trying, to, trying to cure. Um, so just quickly, um, a third type of, of undernutrition that we talked about is m micronutrient deficiencies. And programs that try to address micronutrient deficiencies use a few different approaches. Um, the best long-term approach is, if possible, I think what the um, student over there mentioned, try to ensure that um, people are eating enough different types of foods. And it's sort of a food-based approach. Um, this requires part, this depends partly on people's practices and what the, how they're feeding their children, how they're um, feeding them themselves, but it also uh, depends on the access. What we, when we were talking about the dimensions of food security, that household food access. And this, of course, relates to, to poverty and you know, what, how much um, people can afford to buy, as well as what, what foods are available. Um, another approach is food fortification. Like here in the US, a lot of our food, our oil, a lot of our grains, our cereal, um, is, our, our salt is, is um, fortified with, with iodine, is fortified with essential um, vitamins, vitamins and, and minerals. And that can be an approach to help ensure that the general population as a whole, um, even if you're just eating basic staples, um, you're getting some, some mi micronutrients. So that can be part of the approach as well. And then the third is there are some specific micronutrients, some specific vitamins and minerals that particularly vulnerable groups need at certain times. And in those cases, what we often do is supplementation, where you're actually giving some. It's like when we take multivitamins, that's a form of supplementation. And for instance, young children need vitamin A. And if they don't get it, it can increase their risk of dying. It, increases their risk of, um, it can increase their risk of blindness and other 
um, bad, bad outcomes. So there are programs in a lot of countries to provide vitamin A every six months to children during, you know, while they're during to infants and, and young children. Similarly, as I mentioned before, pregnant women are at high risk of becoming anemic. It has very negative consequences on themselves and on their babies. So in a lot of um, countries, including, including here, um, there's uh, supplementation with iron and folic acid during, during pregnancy. So that's for the utilization. Um, for access, for programs that try to address um, household food access, there's a whole slew of approaches that, that are used. And I've only mentioned some of them here. And one of the reasons why there are so many and why it's a more complex sort of universe of programs is that household food access is much, much more context specific than under, under nutrition is in many ways. When we were talking about a child who had severe malnutrition, if you give them, whether it's a therapeutic milk or the plumpy nut, in most cases, that's going to get them better. Whether the child lives in a city, whether they live in a village, whether they live in Asia, whether they live in Africa, it's a physiological process that a child with severe acute malnutrition needs certain nutrients and certain sort of nutrient density. You know, where there are specific infections, they may need certain um, uh, medicines as well, or antibiotics <laughs> as well. But it doesn't really rely too much on the context. Well, you know, poor household food access is extremely context specific. If you think about you know, in an urban area versus a rural area, what's needed to try to help a household you know, move out of poverty and have greater access to food differs a lot. What's needed, you know, what types of livelihoods, what types of income are available varies a lot. Even within a household, if you have a household where it's, it's led by a woman, the woman is the only, the only adult in the household because the man is deceased or the man is, is absent for whatever reason, the, the opportunities for income may be different than a household where there's a male you know, head of the household, but he has very limited, um, limited income. In some settings, credit, not having enough credit. This is a picture of a program of um, women who are, it's a savings group where they save money and then get, get loans to start small businesses. In some settings, credit constraints, not having enough money to sort of start a small business or sort of move outside of their day-to-day -day subsistence is, is important. Um, in other contexts, home production is important, where there's an agricultural um, where people can actually improve their household food access by, by producing more. Um, food rations can be an important um, um, dimension of this. And certainly income generation over the long term is perhaps the most, the most important. And just to mention, some of these um, also can involve food aid. Um, the food for work type of program I mentioned before can help to contribute to infrastructure. Um, education programs in the long term can help to improve food access because a more educated you know, population has greater capabilities, and they're going to be you know better able to um, to access food. And food for education can be can be helpful um, a, in those cases, especially like for trying to encourage girls to come to schools. Um, sometimes providing a meal as part of the um, as part of the the school can help to encourage parents to send their um, children to school. So again, food is certainly not the only um, or even necessarily the most important um, instrument, but it is an instrument that can help. Um, to, to contribute to this. Um, programs addressing availability. I think the, the biggest one, certainly the biggest one we think about, about food aid, is humanitarian assistance. The examples we gave before of after a war or during a war or after a, you know, an earthquake or a flood or a drought where there's just not food available. Um, food aid as part of humanitarian assistance can be very important. Um, over the longer term, you know, improving agricultural productivity is a critical um, approach, um, improving access to markets and trade so that people um, you know, are able to access or sell their um, food um, is also, um, is also um, an important approach. And then programs addressing stability. Stability, remember, is where people may have food now, but there's always a risk of losing it the next time there's um, some, some kind of shock. Um, again, the emergency response and humanitarian assistance for, f in terms of food aid is probably the most important um, way that, that food aid can, contributes to, to this because when there is that shock, if suddenly there's shortages of food, um, food aid can be an important way of, um, of sort of meet, um, meeting that, that gap. Um, other things are improved storage. This is a picture from a USAID program where they helped to develop a storage facility so that food didn't get you know, contaminated or, or lost um, during, while, while it was being stored. That can be helpful for stability. Safety nets, as I mentioned before, to sort of help meet those, 
um, meet those gaps or to help prevent a shock from reducing food. Um, and then protecting assets, you know, whether that's livestock or equipment, whatever it is that allows you to produce um, I income, protecting those um, can help to um, improve uh, stability. So this is my last couple of slides, and then I'm going to turn it over to um, Ms. Esposito. I mean, I, some of these themes we've touched on already, but I think there are various advantages of food aid and then various uh, limitations. Um, I think first just talking about the advantages, First and foremost, it's food. So it meets basic needs. I mean, we all, we all need, need food. And whether that's specific nutritional needs, and you know, again, the severely acutely malnourished child needs food. And these types of products you know, help to meet those basic needs. Or during emergencies or where households don't have enough food, um, the food aid can help to meet those needs. Um, as I mentioned, it's something that's available. Um, it's something that has political, political support. Um, and therefore, it's something that you know, has consistently been a part of certainly the US governments, but also the UN, the World Food Program, um, a lot of other um, uh, international organizations. Um, so it's, in a, it's a tool that, that's there. Um, one thing I haven't talked about is in some contexts, food aid may lead to less corruption than cash. You can think about if you're in a community setting and you're distributing support. Um, to different households. And if it's cash that's being distributed, you could see along the different steps of the process, whether it's coming from the sort of the headquarters to the field or from the field when they're distributing or in terms of whom it's being, um, who's being um, sort of targeted to distribute to. With cash, everybody likes cash. Um, and I think it's more tempting in some ways to siphon some off or to give it to the people that um, are your partners or your, or your family. And it's easier to, I mean, cash fits in, fits in your pocket. The food aid, it's more conspicuous, and it can be um, harder to, also a lot of food aid like this is, you know, is labeled by, with the, the donor's name. So in some settings, food aid can also lead to, to less corruption. And as I mentioned, it can also help to, in terms of uh, targeting as well, by, by self-targeting people who, were, are, who, need, who need food. Um, some of the challenges and limitations, I mentioned this before, when we think about the money involved in purchasing here, packaging, shipping, then shipping over land in a country, it's not very cost effective in terms of uh, food aid that's coming from the US. And that's one of the, one of the reasons why there's a food aid reform movement to um, increase using vouchers, increase you know, purchasing local, local um, Lo local food. Um, another thing that, that can happen is it can sometimes, food aid, if not done carefully, it can negatively affect local food markets. If there's suddenly a big influx of free food, it can lower the price of food in the local markets, and that can harm local farmers. And that's one of the reasons with, for instance, USAID food, they do what's called a Bellman analysis, which is before sending in food, doing an analysis to get an understanding of how it's going to affect local, local, local markets. Um, in some context, that can create dependence. If there's been food aid for long periods of time, people might just assume it's there, and it will always be there, and it could um, sort of be a disincentive for certain types of uh, economic activity. Um, and then lastly, it may not always be the greatest need, although it's a tool that's there. It may be because it's the tool that we have, that's what we use. Um, and in some contexts, it may not be what's, what's most needed. And that's, I think, important in, as we design programs and as we think about what, what we're doing to consider, um, to consider what the, what the uh, needs are. So my last slide is just my two cents on this are, and as I mentioned, I've worked a bit in the field on programs and then um, for a number of years providing technical uh, assistance. So I, I'm certainly, um, but I have my own sort of very specific perspective, and I think others have um, have um, maybe better um, perspective or a, sort of a bigger picture sense of this. But from from my own experience, I think, as I say, I mean, hunger and nutrition are massive problems, and I think very critical problems that we as humanity need to address. And I think we should try to use all the tools that are are available. Um, food aid is not at all sufficient on its own to address these problems, but it is one tool. And it is a tool that, uh, from what I've seen, can be effective, can be very effective in a lot of, in a lot of different uh, contexts. Um, and I'll leave you just with this last thought, which is that the quality of how programs are implemented matters a tremendous amount. And this is just um, my own observation. I, I think um, we often focus a lot, and a lot of what I've been talking about 
is a particular approach. You know, does cash work better? Do vouchers work better? Does food aid work better? Do we want to be approaching it by looking at poverty? Do we want to be approaching it by looking at dietary you know, diversity? What sort of um, foods are we want to be promoting? And all those things are, are absolutely critical. I mean, you want to have the best, you know, the best interventions that you can. Um, however, at the same time, how effectively we implement programs. Are we reaching the people that we want to reach? Are we, if we're providing education and counseling, is the quality of that education and counseling there? Are we monitoring and you know, improving our programs based on what's happening? Are we listening to community members to understand what, what their needs are? All of these different things that go into, into quality, I think are also, are also very, very um, important. So that's just the last thought to leave you with. Thank you very much. I think I'll turn it over to uh, Ms. <laughs> Ms. 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 All right, well, um, I will let our speaker get comfortable here for just a minute, but our next speaker, as Dr. Castleman had said, is Dina Esposito. Um, she is the director of the Office of Food for Peace in the Bureau of Democracy, Conflict, and Human Humanitarian Assistance at USAID. Uh, prior to joining USAID in December of 2010, Ms. Esposito managed and advised on democracy, government, and conflict mitigation programs for PACT, a U.S. non-governmental organization serving both Ethiopia and PACT's regional office in Kenya. So she has a lot of experience in Africa. From 2000 to 2006, she was a consultant, and she worked with USAID, non-governmental organizations, and a Washington, D.C.-based think tank, and the International Organization for Migration, um, where she focused on post-conflict uh, reconstruction, conflict mitigation, planning, policies, and programs. Um, before that, she also worked for USAID um, in the Bureau of Humanitarian Response in the Office of the U.S. Foreign Disaster Assistance, the Office of Transition Initiatives, and the Office of Program Planning and Evaluation. So she has a long career at USAID. Um, she also served in the Africa Bureau's Office of Central and West African Affairs. So I'm going to turn it over to Dina. Thank you. I hope that some of you will be inspired to really think about getting into food security as a career, because uh, it is just a fascinating window onto a range of issues, be it public health, politics, um, nutrition. And so I think um, hopefully they'll, you'll be enticed into learning more by what you hear today. Uh, I am a political appointee, full disclosure. I've been in this job for three years. And I come at it uh, having a path that has exposed me to food aid a lot. I worked in refugee camps. I've worked in disaster settings, uh, post-conflict settings, uh, but never had worked directly on, on food aid. And, and so uh, for me, it's still very much of a learning, a learning curve as well. But so thank you for the opportunity to, to speak to you all. Um, I want to talk about three main themes today. I want to talk a little bit about the history of food aid, so you know where it's coming from, and then drill down a bit on the pres President Obama's food aid reform proposal. I'd like to touch briefly on how nutrition science is impacting food aid. You've heard a little bit about RUTF today. And then I want to touch upon this idea of resilience. There's a new concept emerging in the both development and relief worlds around the issue of building resilience of communities affected by chronic poverty and recurrent crisis. And I know that you had a reading today by Chris Barrett, which talks about going from safety nets to cargo nets, and I thought, this topic of resilience would be um, helpful as you, as you try to process what he was writing about in that paper. Um, so my goal is to leave you with an understanding that food assistance is dramatically changing. It's a very exciting time to be in this field. Um, and perhaps the largest transformation since President Eisenhower created the first legislation for food assistance, which was in 1954, and since President Kennedy named it Food for Peace in 1961. For those of you who don't know, the Office of Food for Peace is named for the title of the, for the legislation. Um, so, next slide. So in order to know where we're going with food assistance, you need to know where we're coming from. Um, here you see the legislation authorizing food assistance. 
Uh, as most of you are probably aware, U.S. food aid has traditionally been associated with the agricultural committees in Congress and, was off and is authorized largely through the Farm Bill. And until 2010, aid was provided exclusively in kind as, a, as a wheat, sorghum, corn, rice, a variety of pulses, vegetable oil, all of which was bought in the United States and shipped overseas. Throughout the 70s, 80s, and 90s, the vast majority of food aid was actually funded under Titles 1, 3, and Section 416B of the Farm Bill. And that aid was not, at, in fact, project-based or targeted to feed specific people. Rather, the U.S. food aid was given to the U.S. by foreign governments, the Titles 1 and 3, in the form of concessional sales or grants. And the governments, in turn, sold that food on the commercial market to generate cash for budget support. Section 416B was the surplus donation program uh, where U.S. farm surpluses were sent abroad, as, again, as either concessional sales to governments or as grants. Um, perhaps the longest standing myth today is that the food aid program of the United States is a surplus disposal program. In fact, surplus disposal 416B, Titles I, Title III have not been funded for many years. They remain on the books authorized, but they're not legislated. Uh, sorry, they're authorized but not appropriated. Um, so since really the 90s, and I should mention that all food aid now in the U.S. is procured on the open market at commercial prices. And that's an important point to remember when we come to food aid reform and, and the rationale for it. Food aid accounts, in fact, for less than 1% of all U.S. food exported from the, from the United States. Um, so today, USAID's Office of Food for Peace is funded under Title II. And you'll hear often people just refer to the Title II program. That is the in-kind food program um, administered by AID. And it is uh, a grants-based program whereby the United States gives food not to governments, um, but rather in the form of grants to the United Nations or to non-governmental organizations, such as CARE, Catholic Relief Services, many of which you're, I'm sure, familiar with. Um, so with the end of the bilateral food aid programs, Titles I and III, and the surplus disposal programs, food aid really became increasingly scarce and a much more professionalized kind of area of endeavor. And that's what you heard about just now, uh, where you have organizations that are really organized around uh, getting it right, focusing on markets, understanding uh, how to better target. You've got new a variety of tools, the household economy models, livelihood models, other ways of trying to identify vulnerable groups and assure that the assistance is appropriate to, to what the circumstances are. You also have a dramatic improvement in early warning systems, this combination of remote technologies and on-the-ground assessment to really give us uh, a very, um, well, now I was going to say real time, but well in advance we have a good idea of what a lot of the needs are going to be in places where you have slow onset crises like, like droughts. Um, since fiscal year 2010, in fact, I don't know if you can see down there, the Foreign Assistance Act seems to be cut off. But since fiscal year 2010, the uh, Food for Peace has also been funded under the Foreign Assistance Act. And uh, we have had this cash-based assistance program that's allowed us to expand the way we do food aid. In fact, the reason you see now the terms food assistance, it's a bit code. If you're not in the circle, you don't know. But food aid refers to in-kind food. Food assistance refers to the range of tools uh, to <coughs> improve food security for vulnerable groups. So you've heard a little bit about local and regional procurement and the cash transfers and food vouchers. And all of that is sort of captured under this broader, more generic term of food assistance. Um, so. In addition to this, which, is now, which, is, which are pictures of how Title II in-kind food aid is shipped and warehoused, and there's a beneficiary receiving uh, some yellow split peas, we have this. This is a picture of how a cash grant is being used in both uh, the DRC Congo on the left and Pakistan on the right, where um, we are providing assistance uh, through uh, the pr purchase of foods locally, supporting local farmers and local merchants to uh, provide food assistance to conflict-affected communities in those countries. And these uh, photos are actually quite important for us on the Hill 
because many congressmen want some assurance that we are indeed still telling people that these are gifts of the American people. And so these are just examples of how locally procured food is, is branded. And we also now have the possibility of doing this. This is an example of food insecure populations, in this case refugees, who are in a local supermarket in a refugee camp uh, in Turkey with a debit card. And they're able to choose the vegetables and fruits and uh, fresh foods that they would like to eat and then use a swipe card uh, to take that food home and prepare it. And they can go to the market every day if they want, it's up into to the amount of resources they're, they're given as a family for, for the monthly food transfer. Um, so since 2010, through the Foreign Assistance Act, Food for Peace has been given $300 million to do this kind of programming in addition to the Title II. And last year, this $300 million was supplemented with a, a basically a plus up because of the Syria crisis, um, the large numbers of refugees and, and people affected inside Syria. Uh, so that last year we spent close to $600 million in cash-based food assistance. That's in addition to the $1.4 billion in in-kind food. So that makes the United States not only the largest provider of in-kind food in the world, but also the largest provider of cash-based food assistance in the world. And it, it's based on these experiences that President Obama in fiscal year 2014 uh, proposed um, to dramatically expand funding for these kinds of activities through food aid reform. So before I, I'd like to spend a minute on that proposal because I think it's important and it's yielded some interesting results. I want to make a couple of comments so that you can better understand the reform agenda. I've talked about the rise of uh, sort of the specialization around food aid as, and referred mostly to emergency response. What you heard about in the first presentation was a lot around how food is trying to be used to address some underlying issues of access and utilization. And those are really what we call, you know, we call them development programs, development food assistance. And uh, before I talk about food aid reform, you need to know that there remains some, not, it's not all exclusively emergency food aid. Food for Peace does a program that's focused on development food assistance, and these are some of the objectives of the programs, much like the one Tony spoke to you about. What you need to understand before I talk about food aid reform is that Congress requires us by law in the Farm Bill to implement development programs with food assistance. The second point is that Congress requires us to sell some of this food abroad to generate cash to implement the developmental aspects of the program that complement food. So food by itself is not particularly developmental. It can be used as an incentive, as you heard, and other things to get people into nutrition, to clinics, and that sort of thing. But if you want to pay nurses, if you want to pay ag extension workers, if you want to do a behavior change model module, you need money. And the food aid account says, well, we have a lot of food. You sell the food and generate the money, and then you can do your development program with the food. The process of selling, selling food overseas to generate currency is called monetization. And that's a word, um, if you follow food aid reform, was much used. So one of the key tenets of the reform is ending monetization for USAID on the grounds that it is inefficient and if done poorly has the potential to disrupt markets. So the President's food aid reform proposal asked Congress to move the food assistance programming completely out of the farm bill, that one billion plus dollars, take it out, put it all over into the Foreign Assistance Act. Um, and why did he do that? Well, for one reason, this is what's happening with our dollars. In 2002, we were able to buy five million tons of food with our budget. In 2011, we were able to buy closer to 1.5 million tons of food with our budget. The, the cost of move, buying and shipping a ton of food from the United States has gone from about $400 a ton to a thousand, over a thousand dollars a ton. So the the challenge we have with our budgets is that even as it grows, we just don't have. It's not an era of cheap food. It is not an era of food surpluses. It's extremely uh, costly. So.
So the proposal was built on evidence that shows us that by, by, by buying food locally or regionally, we can save 25 to 50 percent. And that's done based on a set of data that actually Chris Barrett did for some of the nonprofit NGOs who were engaged in using some of our resources and USDA's for local and regional procurement. In addition, we found that for every um, dollar we spent on food in the United States and we sold it overseas for the monetization, we lost 25 cents. So in fiscal year 12, Food for Peace monetized food and we got $31 million less for it than we paid for it. So again, very, just a very inefficient way to generate cash. Um, the reform proposal that was also shaped by the desire to improve the timeliness of our response and giving affected populations the dignity of choice through cash transfers or food vouchers. And if we have time, there's a really nice and very, I think, simple, straightforward public service announcement that CARE did, and if, if I don't run out of time, it's about two minutes long, and I it, it, it think it's a really nice snapshot. I talk all the time about food aid reform, and this one just kind of lays it out without a lot of words. I think it's, it's very good. Um, so what happened with this fiscal year 14 effort by the president? Well, they didn't move the money out of the Farm Bill and into the Foreign Assistance Act. And if you want, we can talk a little bit more about why. Um, but as this budget this debate was happening for fiscal year 14, the Farm Bill was being reauthorized. And so what became a, what was originally an appropriations strategy by the administration shifted into a conversation around authorization and how food aid is authorized. And what happened in the Farm Bill, which was recently, just recently signed, is that uh, the um, committees gave us $100 million more in cash flexibility within the Title II account. So we wanted a billion, but we got 100 million, which is a start. Uh, I think we really felt that that was quite a remarkable achievement within the Farm Bill. And a major victory, I would say, for USAID on the development side, because these additional cash funds mean that we will no longer have to monetize uh, US food to fund the Food for Peace development portfolio, with the exception of one country. There is a 15% monetization minimum that re remains in the bill, which requires us to monetize in one country. But this compares to the more than a dozen countries we had to monetize in in fiscal year 12. So, a huge, huge change for us, um, and much, and very welcome. So where are we now? Is it over? Are we done pushing for food aid reform? Well, the president has come back in fiscal year 2015, which is where we are now, and the Congress is considering this request to say, um, well, thank you, we got, a, we got a down payment in the Farm Bill. Now you've told me, you, the, the, far, the ag committees, that you're willing to be flexible. So rather than ask you to take all that money and put it over into the Foreign Assistance Act, could you not authorize within the Farm Bill 25% flexibility? So of, of the billion dollars plus in the Farm Bill, give us 25% of that. And if you do, recalculate the efficiency savings will allow us to reach two million more people with the same amount of money. So that's, that's the game that's in play right now. So parallel to all of this effort around reform and getting more uh, efficient and different types of programming approaches, there's also a lot of change going on inside the Title II in-kind food aid basket. And that's as a result of this Tufts University-led food aid quality review that brought together many, many people in the world of academia, uh, commodity groups, manufacturing groups, uh, implementing partner groups, to ask the question, what is the appropriate nutritional profile of in-kind food to best meet the needs of vulnerable communities that we serve. There's a much better understanding and an evolving science around nutrition, which we want our food aid program to be informed by. And this really set the framework, it came out I think in 2011, for changing all of our, all of our products uh, that, are, that are blended or, or milled. So, our, all of our wheat flours have a new reformulation, our newly for, differently fortified, our corn soy blends, which are used for the prevention of malnutrition, uh, are differently fortified, and there are a range of other um, improvements that we're making to the standard food basket. In addition, we have begun the manufacture of these ready-to-use foods to combat malnutrition. 
so here we have a situation where we have sort of a, a really a life-changing pro uh, product that the United States had not been offering to its partners in food aid, which just didn't make a lot of sense. And so um, we have begun uh, to produce 10% of UNICEF's global demand for ready-to-use foods to treat malnutrition, the RUTF, and 10% of the World Food Program's global requirements for ready-to-use supplementary foods. The RUTF is used, they look a lot alike, and they're not that different, but this is used to treat severe acute malnutrition, and this one for uh, moderate acute malnutrition. So these are now part of the new food basket, as are um, a, a, a meal replacement bar uh, called A29. No, not very interesting name, uh, but they are meant for rapid onset emergencies where someone, say, as in the, the Philippines, they are, you know, they're wiped out, there's no access to clean water, there's no access to food. You can live on these, they provide all the nutrients you need. You wouldn't want to live on them for more than a few days, I can tell you that. But you can, but they are uh, highly nutritious uh, meal replacement bars. So we have these now being produced here as well. So I'm shifting gears now because I want to talk about cargo get nets and safety nets, as Chris would say. Um, I don't, I, there's been a, a recent growing interest in the concept of resilience. Um, and that's very much brought on in light of the Horn of Africa experience, which had the worst drought in 60 years in 2011, including salmon, famine conditions in Somalia. And there were nearly 14 million people at risk during that drought. And the following year in the Sahel, 18.7 million people at risk of food insecurity due to a combination of factors, including drought. This drought followed shocks, food shocks in 2008 and 2010. Um, so this slide is driving home the growing frequency of food insecurity, and that's true not only in Kenya, but across the Horn and in the Sahel, for example. Whereas drought used to affect Kenya every five or ten years, now you're seeing drought every two to three years. And what happens? People sell off their assets, they engage in a variety of coping strategies, many of them negative, that leave them worse off than they were before. And before they have a chance to recover, they're hit again. Um, so the interest in resilience stems from an understanding that just throwing humanitarian aid at them and this idea of bringing them back to a level of where they were before the shock no longer has a lot of relevance. Because they where, where they are is below the poverty line, below, uh, they're in this poverty trap. So you're not really getting them, it's really not a satisfactory end state. Um, so, there was this recognition that aid is a, humanitarian aid is sort of a losing endeavor in these chronic crises and that under, not addressing the underlying causes of food insecurity is not just a humanitarian disaster but a serious economic growth issue for affected countries. Here you see that Kenya suffered $12 billion in livestock losses uh, due to recent droughts. So USAID together with affected governments and other stakeholders have made a new commitment to addressing this intersection of chronic poverty <coughs> and recurrent crisis. This is, uh, comes from a new policy paper that we've just issued uh, describing our, there are many definitions of resilience. This is our definition. And I think very importantly, it focuses not just on reducing vulnerability, but facilitating inclusive growth. The developmental aspect appears here. Uh, and this was a much debated, much discussed uh, definition. Um, so while development practitioners have generally focused on the most productive parts of a country to generate the most developmental impact, you're now seeing a willingness of development experts to sit with humanitarian actors and in cooperation with effective governments, develop a shared problem analysis and joint problem solving that layers and sequences development interventions over humanitarian in interventions. So building resilience is understood to be the task of both development and relief practitioners working together to build the capacity of affected communities to mitigate and adapt to shocks. Um, so as, the result of, as a result of the resilience agenda, you're seeing, for example, new development dollar commitments in areas where humanitarian caseloads are high. Again, getting going from the safety net to the cargo net. Uh, in northern Kenya, for example, 
Uh, we've initiated new development initiatives that build on a WFP food for asset, uh, cash for asset program that you heard Tony talk about. Um, layering on top of that livelihood diversification support for people coming out of those WFP programs as well as um, a livestock value chain development um, effort. So over the last decade, three quarters of USAID humanitarian aid has gone to just 10 countries. That tells you the challenge we're facing with people just falling over and over and again. Um, so ultimately, these resilience efforts aim to save and improve more lives as well as decrease the need for repeated uh, humanitarian assistance. Um, so I, it, to me, as someone who's been on the emergency side uh, most of my career, it's, it's a very exciting opportunity and getting a lot of traction, not just in AID, but among other donors and being led uh, by regional governments, by, by, by governments and regional bodies like EGAD in the Horn and Silson in the Sahel. So those are the three issues, three ideas I want to leave you with. Changing nature of food assistance, the importance of improved nutrition as food assistance programming, and this idea of resilience as being an opportunity to get from safety nets to cargo nets. And if we have a minute, I can show that slide. <laughs> this is the sound of hungry children who are getting the chance to eat. Sounds like these don't happen by accident. They happen because aid groups like CARE, governments, and the American people work together. Since the 1950s, the U.S. has sent food overseas to people who are hungry, people in crisis. It's been bought in the U.S., put on U.S. ships, and sent across the ocean. In the beginning, this worked pretty well, and it made sense because the U.S. had a surplus of grain. But now, 60 years later, there are almost one billion hungry people worldwide, most of whom are women and girls. The surpluses of U.S. grain are gone, and the cost of shipping has gone up so much that over half of every dollar in aid can go to transportation and operation costs, not to food for hungry people. And transporting the food so far takes time. In fact, shipping food from the U.S. to a hungry family can take as long as four months. That's a long time when people are hungry. Sounds crazy, right? We agree. So that's why we're supporting a novel idea borrowed from forward-thinking Americans, Buy Local. By reforming and modernizing food aid in emergencies like natural disasters, the U.S. and aid agencies like CARE could take money instead of sacks of grain and buy food from small-scale local farmers, many of whom are women. By buying closer to people in need, the food only has to travel a fraction of the distance that shipping it from the U.S. requires, so it gets to hungry families and children faster. And in an emergency, that can mean life or death. Buying local means we save money on transportation so we can buy more food and feed more hungry people. Buying local also means local economies begin to thrive, just like they do when Americans buy local. And we support the farmer's ability to provide food for years to come. It's a hand up, not a hand out. But we don't want to completely cut out American-grown food either. We'll still deliver a lot of American corn and rice too so we have flexibility in regions where it's impossible to buy local or where there just isn't any food to be found. By reforming food aid, we can use taxpayer dollars more effectively, stretch every dollar further, support poor women farmers, and feed more hungry people. The reforms we want to put in place will allow CARE and other aid groups to use the same amount of money to help up to four million more people. Now that's efficient. That's common sense. That's responsible use of taxpayer dollars. Well, I do, I, we are out of time for today, but um, I, I can see why you wanted to show that video, and I think it's a great video. So thank you all for staying. Um, I want to thank our speakers today. Can we have another round of applause for our fabulous speakers?